Hello and welcome to another Daily Muppet. In today's video, I want to talk about the Sofyan Amrabat situation and where it's at. Go over if we're expecting any other incomings, the kind of sell to buy constraints that United are being put under, and uh, discuss once again the thing that I keep saying I don't want to keep discussing, but then things keep coming out that I think um, do need to be discussed the Mason Greenwood situation. So let's get into it. <laughs> All right, so uh, starting with Sophia and Amrabat, and uh, apologize, I feel a little off today, so uh, um, a little less energetic than usual. But regarding Amrabat, obviously the news that came out yesterday was that uh, from from a few Italian reporters was that Amrabat ha was in talks or had been had some sort of discussions with Liverpool. And one of the pieces of news that came with that, and I actually do not know if this is new or if this is old, like happened a long time ago, but that he uh, has changed agents as well. And the reason why that's relevant is in January, um, Amrabat and his agent, which maybe was his brother's his representation at the time, uh, met with or spoke with Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp and something happened there that essentially broke the relationship down and put off his move to Liverpool where he did not want to go there anymore and um, there's just something broken between them and I'm, it seems to be happening to Klopp quite a lot recently with players that uh, they don't seem to be getting along with him very well. <laughs> And I don't know why that is, but uh, but something like that keeps happening. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, basically my concern was, and I don't know what Liverpool are doing, and I don't like to guess either because very often Liverpool tend to just come out out of the blue and do something. And um, so it's it's impossible to guess and say, oh, yeah, they're definitely not signing this player. They definitely are, uh, as they did yesterday, quite out of the blue, signing this Endo from from uh, from Germany, this uh, Japanese player. Um, zero. I don't think there was any links or indications of it beforehand, and in one day, it's like done, right? And that's Liverpool. So I worry when I see anything like that that um, that there's legitimacy to it, that the new agents would be, you know, mending fences essentially and fixing up the situation or something to make it plausible for Amrabat to go to Liverpool. Um, I don't know if that situation has advanced at all. For United, you know, Amrabat is in, is, is something where obviously they, they are completely informed on the situation via his representatives and all of that, wages, all of that kind of stuff, how much he would cost, the general gist of it. But they have not moved into talks with Fiorentina. And it's been overblown how advanced it's been for like a month now. Now, that being said, most everybody still felt it's going to happen. And I think there's still a very good chance of it. Uh, but United are in a kind of a difficult situation. They have not started the talks with Fiorentina yet. One would hope they could start them very soon. They wanted to get it done this week, I believe that there was some discussions between intermediaries even this week um, in the last couple of days to get again the terms of the outline and assess the position of the of the club on it so they can really fully define the terms since they're going to have to move fast. They can't just start from scratch with a week left. Um, but they're still in a situation where there's two kind of assessments. One is, can they afford a more expensive player? Um, which is right now, no. <laughs> do they need another midfielder? Do they need another forward, which we'll talk about? And are they in a position where they can even move yet before selling to buy? And that remains the situation. I, I mentioned this yesterday, but I sort of started getting this, this feeling like, um, not this feeling, but I was getting indications that United had to do something before they could do something else. And when people look at Chelsea and talk about well, how, how on earth can they do all of this? I mean, yeah, they're incredibly ambitious. 
But one of the things they also do, which United are starting, are this summer improving upon that we have not done before, is Chelsea sell off young talents for really good prices for profit. One of the reasons they can do that is because they're on extremely low wages. Um, you know, for example, take a player like Brandon Williams. He's on seventy five thousand a week. No one's paying seven. No one's going to pay a, a a package for him because he's on seventy five thousand a week. And in order to match those kind of wages or to cover it, um, they can't afford the transfer fee. That's a, one of the major problems. The other problem is, of course, that over the years, Chelsea and City from their academies have produced a lot of talents that they've sold off that have gone on to become talents, especially Chelsea. And so teams pay a premium for their players on the betting chance that they're going to be very good. And United have not really historically done that. This year, we've started moving some players on Zidane Ball, you know, Charlie Savage, Kovar, uh, Elanga. We started actually selling some of these young players off. And hopefully, some of them are start to turn out really well so that over the coming years, we can start to sell the ones that we don't think are ready for United or there's not a place for them with buybacks, with sell ons like City do it. And uh, like Alvaro Fernandez, for example sell them with a buyback, with a sell-on, so that potentially there's some value there um, and that clubs start to see that, hey, it's worth buying United youth and that will keep bumping the prices up and that will contribute to FFP. Chelsea have sold an enormous amount of, of, of young players that uh, they've got a profit on that will really allow them to spend a lot of money. Now, could United spend more? I think so. Based on the math that I, that, that I can see, they're almost break even in terms of players that have walked left when you factor in wages, profit, things like that, and, and put the amortized value in place compared to what they've purchased. But that's not including sign-on bonuses and things like that. But it's almost even. It's almost even. And the wage bill's been reduced, I think, overall. It's almost even. So they probably could spend more, but... The limitations for United are set by the owners for the most part. And I feel as though they've been trying with this FFP thing. When you look at it, um, there's this point on losses where they actually did get fined on losses. It's not so much the, the 70, 80, 90% cap that we were doing all the math on before when it was later defined that it was based on losses and how they could count losses during COVID and stuff. Um, United can't afford to lose money uh, on the books and, and they struggle with FFP for that. However, they could spend more. As far as I understand it, they could spend more. You know, it's it's always about that willingness. But what has essentially been indicated right now is they need to sell to buy. And Amrabat, I would say, is still the most likely person in, to come in. And there's still a good chance that he comes in. I would say there's still better than than 50% odds that they get another signing in the door. Um, and that some more sales occur. But it is really going to depend on getting something moving in terms of the outs to free things up. Because it's, it's not there yet. It's not there yet. And that's just the indication that they've been given. Is uh, that people in the club have been given is that they must now move someone out before another person can come in. And a big part of that is Dean Henderson not leaving. That was a, a sale that they planned for a month ago. It looked really close. They were thinking, okay, even if it's a loan with obligation, we just want to set the terms so that before the end of December, we have that 20, 25 million. We can count on our books against FFP and it's pure profit. It's a big sale. They didn't get that. And so they're kind of behind where they thought they would be by now in that regard. And it is an area that has to improve. It is an area that they have to do a lot better. But that's sort of the word right now is sell to buy. If they can move someone on, then Amrabat becomes possible. And depending on how much they move on, then potentially someone else becomes possible. But there's other factors here too. So I've, let's talk about um, this Mason Greenwood thing because I have a, th a few thoughts that I want to share. And I want to... Um, I want to challenge a couple of things. I don't want to just repeat everything that's already been said and um, and give outrage and, and things like that because I think that there's... Um, 
it's a messy situation. I'm not a, you know, obviously what, what happened yesterday, uh, if we look at the athletic, the athletic came out and said that in early August, essentially around the beginning of August, I think when I came back from Las Vegas, I did a video on August 2nd and I said that I got the impression from people I spoke with that Mason Greenwood would be returning. Um, the Athletic published something that said right at basically the exact same time, Richard Arnold had informed senior staff that Mason Greenwood would be returning and um, <clears throat> prepared a video announcement or something like that or whatever for it. And, um, and then they delayed it and then something else happened. And, but essentially they were going to run that story. United got wind of it or they informed United and then United ran kind of a counter briefing announcement to say no decision has been made. That's not the truth. That's not what happened and all of that. Um, it's not for me to adjudicate who is correct on this. I think people can make their own minds up. And I think that from my standpoint, you know, obviously there's information I and many others had heard back then that I would stand by. Um, but it's it's complicated. Um, you know, the the United as statement, the big you know, it's very funny is if you read the United statement, it almost looks like it's missing one sentence, which is the decision has been made and Mason Greenwood will return to the team when you read it. It says that they're looking at a lot of evidence, obviously not in the public domain. It says that people have made up their minds on something while seeing potentially just a small amount of evidence that's not in the public domain. Um, and, you know, when you look at the emails that people are getting back, understandably prepared statements, it kind of keeps indicating that point. And I've actually heard quite a bit about this, about why. And it, it makes matters complicated. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of things I want to kind of kind of challenge about this to people. I, I it, It's obviously such a sensitive topic. And obviously, pretty much everybody had the indication it looks like they're going to be, they were going to be bringing Mason Greenwood back. As of yet, they have not said anything that would indicate a U-turn or a change, but the insistence on no decision being made obviously gives pause to will he, he return? Are they going to change their minds? But let me just say a couple of things about this that are honestly slightly challenging statements, but I think that people have to, um, I think that it's important that people, you know, I, I think it's important that people think about these things too. One, one thing I've seen said a lot is that he can return to football, just not at United. And I think that I have a huge disagreement with that statement in general. Um, because the implication of it is that other clubs, other leagues, other places, other countries even, uh, it, it has a very odd weight behind it, uh, in, in my opinion, it, just to me. It, it just has a very odd implication, which is that, you know, not in my Britain or something like that, um, not at my club, but I'm fine with it. it existing in football. And I, I, that part I disagree with. Um, if, if you think it's wrong for, for Mason Greenwood to return, understandably, then it, I think it would be inconsistent to say it's okay for him to return somewhere else. Like their moral standing doesn't really matter. And that's just one thing I want to challenge because I've seen that sentiment a lot and I don't really understand it at all. Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't understand it. Um, it doesn't really make sense to me, I guess, is, is what I would say about it. It's uh, I, I don't like the not my problem kind of implication of it, out of sight, out of mind implication of it, even if it's how people think or how they would act. And sure, it's easier if it's happening somewhere else. Like nobody's losing sleep at United because Arsenal are employing somebody. Um, but that doesn't make it better, does it? I don't know. It doesn't. Uh, it makes one me feel more comfortable about their club, but maybe is that right to pass it on to somebody else? Um, then there's this point of, this is the thing I kind of, there's a very challenging 
subject matter, if United do strongly feel that they have viewed evidence outside of the public domain and in addition to far more in addition to or surrounding or related to what people have seen and that they have way more evidence and they're saying that in statements then they've become the arbiter over Mason Greenwood's guilt or innocence even if it's no longer a criminal matter because essentially they've made the statement that they have viewed a load of evidence if they don't bring him back now they are essentially saying he is guilty of these crimes based on us viewing a lot more evidence than what's in the public domain. Now, the implication from the way that they've written it is that the evidence that they've seen says the opposite, that it changes the circumstances and is a big part of why they would be willing to let him return. That's the obvious kind of undertone to how it's been stated and, and what's out there. And the issue is, of course, nobody has seen it. Um, people, Most of the people within the club have not seen it. People who are concerned about him returning have not seen that evidence. Obviously, fans haven't seen that evidence, and maybe they never will. If he is to return, I don't think it's enough to say we have seen other evidence that makes it different. Something has to be shown about that, and I, and I just wonder if that's the complication. And that's the delay in the whole process, is they don't know how to show that evidence. But if they can't show that evidence, if they cannot provide valid reasoning that, that is uh, acceptable to people, if they're unwilling to, or if, you know, I understand that, and, and this is a challenge because there's a right to privacy from, from uh, Mason and the, and, the, and the woman involved in the situation as well. Um, that's it. Legally, that's all very, very technical and challenging, but I do wonder if that's a part of the delay. Um, but it's hard because I think without seeing that and changing what people have seen with their very own eyes and read with their very own eyes and heard with their very own ears, uh, it's going to be very hard to change hearts and minds about the situation. But finally, one little point I want to make on this too because to me, I think this is a, a point that one has to think about in terms of the club itself and how they go about things. If they do actually believe that they have seen evidence that suggests things are not what they appear, for example, if they do actually believe that, if Richard Arnold believes that to be the case, that he has seen things that totally indicate it is not what people believe about the whole situation and that there's no wrongdoing, then he has to bring Mason back. If he has seen that and he believes that and he doesn't bring him back and essentially hangs him for it, because that's pretty much what happens now if they don't bring him back, right or wrong, then he would only not be bringing him back to protect his own skin and would be essentially hanging an innocent, innocent, in his eyes, person. That is a really difficult situation, and that is something that makes this, to me, very complicated. If the club or the people doing the investigation honestly and fully believe one thing, they have to go with that. They have to go with that. They cannot not do it. And this goes the other way too. If they think he's done wrongdoing for real, they can't bring him back on the basis of there's enough support. It, it cannot, that's why it can't be based on the fans. If they think that nothing was wrong actually and it's it's totally different to what people believe then they cannot essentially condemn him um and if they think he has done wrong they cannot just forgive him it has to, and that's why it really does have to be based on this investigation and that's why the delays where it feels like the responsibility has been pushed onto the fans to make the decision or that their support is being gauged or that they're 
their protest is being engaged to me is, is a really a, a dangerously bad implication because it cannot be done on the basis of the club saving its own skin. It has to be done based on this investigation, as they said it would be. Either direction. If it's, if it's bad and they can't have, bring him back just because there's enough support, and if it's good, then they can't let him not come back because people are angry about it. And then they have to solve that problem. So it, it's, it's very complicated. It's, it's a mess, and I think that personally a lot of it could have been avoided by simply doing it quickly and directly and making it very clear. There's a lot that could still leak out. And I don't want to bring these things up, but there's so much that could still come out. And the longer this goes, the more likely those things come out. And every single thing that comes out is going to make it worse for the club. And it doesn't even mean they're doing something wrong. It's just because there's no finality. And, um, and it's a mess. Moving on to, to Rasmus Hoyland. He obviously posted today that he would be back soon, essentially, on Instagram um, that he's training, you know, they're, they're training today. And as I understood it, uh, Spurs bench was like a very initial and optimistic target. I don't know if they will make that. Um, because it, when, when, when the injury then came out and it started to be talked about more, they started talking about more like Forrest or Arsenal. Spurs, initially the target was Spurs on the bench and he's training, he's doing fitness, he's been working, he's on grass. We haven't seen group training photos to see if he's with the group yet. If he's with the group yet, then he has a chance to make it on, on Saturday. There's a press conference today that for some reason wasn't live. Um, so I guess we'll get stuff on that later. I don't know. But uh, obviously need him back. I think Rasmus Hoyland coming in would be one of the biggest improvements that the club could that could be made right now in terms of how United are playing, getting a big focal point striker up front, and, and as well strengthening the wings pushing Marcus Rashford essentially the ability to come to the wings and all of that and have a big, you know, physical body up front. So very excited for that. Hopefully this is all going well. As I said, I don't think the injury is very serious as far as I understood it. Um, but it's looking like he could be on the bench very soon. And that's a good thing. And then finally, and obviously this ties into the Greenwood thing, um, Eric Ten Hag had expected by this, I, I said this yesterday, I think, but Eric Ten Hag had expected by now from, from weeks ago that he was already going to have another option in that forward line because it's still a complex situation where they want to send Palistri on loan, but they can't yet, and, uh, and things like that. And so, um, you know, he is... Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's tricky right now, and they're, they're, they're. I think Eric Tenog is pushing for. I need somebody in, or I need a signing, or something to have more options up front. Even when Hoyland returns, they're a little bit short. So they're working on this, but obviously the funds are not necessarily there. They've been offered a few players, but um, you know they've been offered a few players, but they haven't yet been able to move on anything. And I think that the ideal situation for them is that they could get Amrabat in and they don't need to sign another forward. But yeah, there's a there's a little bit of tension. I, I imagine this last few days and last week has been a bit tense at United. And, um, and there's a bit of tension because they have a mini injury crisis and they have this situation and they have, they need to sell to buy. And um, it's, it's looking like, you know, <laughs> it was always a bit hazy after the three the three main signings, and it's getting a little hazier um, because of what they might need. So that's what I've got right now. They're obviously moving forward in it uh, on this to see what they can do, but I would keep an eye on these areas as well for the, the remaining part of the window. Um, lastly, next week, I'm expecting to start something new in addition to the Daily Muppet that uh, should be rather interesting. So... Um, Keep your eyes peeled for something as I hope to uh, an announce something about that very soon as well um, that I think will be some some great content that people will enjoy and, and should just add to, you know, everything around United, okay? So thank you for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, turn notifications on. See you in the next video.